our own Arfian Ted Pena. Um, <laughs> J. Theodore Pena. Yeah, that's me. Right. <laughs> Ted in. Yeah, I kept um, paying on rain. Anyway, so he, as you are, uh, are aware, uh, is not only a member of art, but teaches in the classics department and actually works in various places in um, Rome and Italy, but right now he's working in Pompeii, which is pretty neat. So in that work, he's going to uh, say something about part of his work there, which is quite wonderful, on um, uh, household archaeology, really. Uh, which many people uh, who don't get a chance to work in Pompeii might be working on uh, in other places of the world. So we get to hear from um, uh, Professor Pena uh, about the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project, that is his project there, uh, characterizing and comparing three residential artifact assemblies. So this is a wonderful up close uh, household archaeological example. Really excited about it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Christine. Hi, yeah, I'm gonna uh, speak about uh, one of the projects that I'm uh, involved in, uh, as Christine was saying, at Pompeii, uh, which has been staffed primarily by uh, UC Berkeley graduate students, uh, at least one of whom is out here today. Uh, and I'll tell you about what I've been up to in uh, recent uh, years. Uh, I'll start with some background. Um, that I've been interested in issues of uh, artifact life history for well, over a decade now. I published a book uh, in uh, 2007, which was kind of a detailed effort to sort of investigate what we can say about in particular the life history of uh, ceramics in the uh, Roman world, uh, which kind of got me started on my work at Pompeii, because when I reflected on these kinds of issues, I realized that Pompeii is a place really one of the few places we can get it, many of them. What I'm showing you here is kind of a, uh, a tarted up, uh, uh, ugly Schaeferian uh, model of uh, what most of you will maybe recognize as much simpler diagram, but this will confuse you, thinking about the, the different ways in which uh, pottery flows through, um, <coughs> to be, a, again, a, a vulgar processualist, the uh, systemic context uh, in, uh, in the Roman world, so the kind of thing that I've been uh, thinking about. Um, and flowing from this, I uh, decided to uh, initiate a research project at Pompeii called the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project, or PALHIP, which is kind of nifty, although it does sound like something you might want to have surgically removed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's what I want to talk about today. And the basic idea is that, uh, because I'm kind of old and lazy, uh, I don't want to do what the, is the archaeological equivalent of what this guy is doing when you want to catch fish, you know, you figure out where the fish of the sort you want are biting and when they're biting and you get the right kind of bait and uh, you go down and you throw your line in and kind of the rest is up to the gods, uh, which is even with things like geophysical prospection fundamentally what of much of archaeology remains. I'm going to be more like this guy, right, uh, who goes into the fish market and he knows what he wants and uh, sure, maybe he's not sure when exactly it was caught and who caught it and how long ago and this kind of thing, but you walk right up to the counter and say, I want one of those. So what I'm doing at Pompeii is kind of the archaeological equivalent of that in the sense that uh, rather than conducting any kind of new excavations, which are costly and difficult to get the permits for and to organize and take decades and this sort of thing, uh, the idea is, is that since there's been excavation going on at Pompeii for literally centuries, uh, uh, generally of bad quality, but uh, often recovering uh, sets of artifacts in contexts that are particularly informative with respect to issues of artifact life history. So the idea is, is to cut to the chase, identify some of those sets of materials already in captivity uh, and go there with a small group, not more people I can fit in a car because that's how we get around, uh, and carry out these uh, detailed uh, characterizations of these sets of materials with a view of uh, elucidating aspects of, of artifact life history. Uh, so here's a, a background uh, satellite image of the uh, Bay of Naples. You can see Vesuvius, that giant pimple up there on the upper left. Um, and uh, so the idea is then is uh, we want to document uh, life history of portable material culture at Pompeii with a view to elucidating particularly practices of household uh, uh, consumption. Well, consumption, I'm trying to not use the word household for reasons I might get to a bit later today. Um, 
And uh, we want to learn then about manufacture, acquisition, use, storage, maintenance, repair, modification, reuse, recycling, and discard of these items. Um, and the idea then is we identify these selected sets of materials that were already excavated in the past, uh, principally ceramic, glass, metal, and stone, so non-perishables, thinking about what was our uh, topic of, uh, of, of last week, which was about perishables, uh, that have been uh, excavated uh, by projects in the past. If we now zoom in on the site of Pompeii itself, about two-thirds excavated, uh, the area inside the walls is maybe about 65 hectares. Um, again, uh, we can uh, uh, look a little bit at what we've done. Uh, we carried out a, a first phase, a five-year research cycle from uh, 2012 to uh, 2016. Uh, which involved characterizing sets of materials from a variety of different places in Pompeii or uh, outside the walls of the town in its general uh, environs. Um, and uh, each of these we represented as a distinct sub-project within the larger uh, uh, PALHIP project. And I will talk about one of those sub-projects uh, for comparative purposes a bit later today, but in general I'll skip over that. And what I want to focus on is phase two, uh, a second five-year research cycle, which we started in 2018 and continued uh, last year. Um, and in this project, what we're doing is rather than jumping around, we're focusing on the characterization of the assemblages from a set of residences all in one block within Pompeii. Uh, using the uh, Pompeii designation, it's in uh, Regio 1. The city's divided up by archaeologists into these distinct regions on the basis of the major elements of the road system. And then with each of these regiones, uh, each block or insula in Latin is assigned a distinct number. So we're in uh, regio 1, insula 11 is the, the set of properties that interest us. So uh, what I want to do then is give you some background on this work and then we'll look at some of our results and some of the ways that I'm beginning to uh, get off my can and, and start analyzing them. Uh, and indeed, if you have any suggestions about ways that might be fruitful to do this, I would be very happy to uh, uh, have your, your input. Uh, so if we look at this plan uh, of the uh, uh, town of Pompeii, uh, I've uh, blocked in for you there in red, uh, Regio 1, Insula 11, uh, very close really to the center of the town, but more in that uh, eastern point of the football, Pompeii shaped a little bit like a football, right? Uh, and I'm showing you other places uh, where the sub-projects uh, that we carried out in the first uh, 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 phase of operations were carried out. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, what you see here now is a, a plan of the various properties in the block on the right uh, and uh, a satellite image of the block as you would see it today. Some of the gardens have been replanted, some of the structures re-roofed, uh, so on and so forth. Um, a little bit of background on this insula and, and getting to uh, why I chose it. It was excavated by the Sopritendenza, the Italian Antiquity Service, today it would be called the Parco Archeologico di Pompeii, uh, 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 over various campaigns in the past. In 1912 to 13, uh, the director of excavations, uh, Vittorio Spinazzola, uh, who was determined to follow the main east-west street in Pompeii, the Vita La Bondanza, uh, excavated the facade of this block in 1912-13. Uh, and then uh, in, late in his uh, reign as kind of the excavation director at Pompeii, which lasted uh, well over 40 years and indeed bracketed both the fascist period and the uh, first Italian Republic, miraculously, uh, Amadeo Maiuri excavated uh, the rest of, of the insula uh, from 1952 to 1964. Um, since then, uh, there have been various short studies that looked at specific structures, principally their architecture and, and things of that sort. So that's what we had uh, to draw on. Um, uh, again, a plan of the insula on the right, and what you have here on the left, and it's not clear to me how well you can see this, but this is a synopsis of the different properties on the block. Uh, each region has a unique number, each block or insula has a unique number, and then each doorway around the block is also numbered, so each doorway has a unique address. So we refer to properties by a number, which is the regio and Roman numerals, the insula, and then uh, the one or two doorways, or one or multiple doorways that a, a house might have. Um, and so these are the various properties in each row. Uh, uh, their characterization of what we understand them to have been functionally. Uh, the names that have been given to those by archaeologists in cases where they've been important enough to receive a name. Uh, two different measures of their ground floor area. 
Uh, and in the last column, they're quartile. And this is uh, based on a, a, an approach to uh, analyzing properties at Pompeii developed by a British scholar, Andrew Wallace Hadrill, who ordered them in the size of their ground floor area uh, and divided this, this up into, into quartiles so that he could begin to sort of look for structure in the data. Um, and uh, the point that leaps out here is that uh, these are all relatively modest properties, even though you're seeing a lot of third and fourth quartiles. Um, the fourth quartile ones are very small quartile ones. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to look at uh, assemblages from residential groups. I'm using that rather than households to avoid any kind of, maybe shall I say, interpretation that saying household involves. Um, uh, from what we can infer is the middle or lower end of some sort of socioeconomic hierarchy in the town. Um, and this is because uh, scholars have in the past uh, not surprisingly been engaged by the large uh, impressive properties at Pompeii. And so we know quite a bit about those, but there's been very little work done on, on uh, people uh, uh, in properties that are less imposing than that. And so the idea of this block is that it's taken up primarily by these middle to low size uh, residences, also with very little in the way of workshops and gardens and things like that, which tend to be pretty common out here in the uh, eastern part of the town. And so uh, this block interested me for that reason. It also interested me because uh, I've gotten a little tired of competing for turf in Pompeii. Uh, there are scholars from like, you know, 25 different countries working there. Um, and so I wanted to find a block that also flies totally under the radar, that nobody would be the least bit interested in, so I could kind of have carte blanche there. Uh, and so this block was one that is very unfamous. In fact, it's only uh, famous for one thing. Uh, it has this uh, particular uh, house here in its northeast corner. Uh, which is uh, known as the, the Casa della Venere in Bikini, the, the house of the Venus in the Bikini. Uh, and it's called that because when they were excavating it, just at the time that the Bikini craze was exploding in the early 1950s, it was like a really big deal, you know, uh, that they discovered in that property this statue of the goddess Venus wearing this kind of gilt bikini-like garb. Uh, and so naturally they played this up and it's very famous. And the only thing anyone ever knows about this block pretty much is this is the block where there's the Casa del Venere in Bikini, uh, which is kind of important for an, another more important reason though. Um, and that is that in the uh, mid to late 1980s, just as scholars were beginning to try to work out approaches to studying artifact assemblages at Pompeii, it was a subject of a PhD dissertation by an Australian woman uh, named Melinda Armit, uh, and here you see its title page. Uh, it's out there on the web. I've downloaded the whole thing for free. Uh, and this was a very early effort to characterize an assemblage from a particular property, uh, and in a way, a pioneering work. Uh, and interestingly, uh, uh, she didn't go on in the field, but she gave her data to Penelope Allison, who's, who's kind of the, uh, the doyeness of uh, of this type of study now in, in uh, the Roman world. She's at University of Leicester in the UK. She's from New Zealand, but did her PhD in Australia at the same time as Armit. And she included this in her very influential study of assemblages from uh, 30 Pompeian households, uh, which was published by the UCLA Kotzen Institute. Uh, and then uh, her student, Nick Ray, who did his PhD at the University of Leicester, uh, took Allison's rendition of Armit's data and used that in his uh, kind of path-breaking and not so well-known and still unpublished PhD dissertation, uh, which looked at artifact assemblages in the Roman world generally and Pompeii specifically, uh, taking on board a lot of the theoretical and methodological work that's been done, for example, in North American historic archaeology. And so it turns out that one of our residences has this assemblage which has figured in these two very prominent studies that so gave us kind of a, a hook into those, right? And so that was another thing which made this block very interesting. Um, here's our uh, two field teams in 2018, 2019. Uh, as you can see in the lower right in 2019 we had our bad days and our good days and then we kind of had our in-between kind of days, right? Uh, and uh, I'll be talking a bit about some of the work that these people uh, have, uh, have done. Now, um, the first part of our work is archival, which is kind of a challenge because a lot of the basic archives have been sent out to be um, uh, PDF'd, uh, and, uh, which is a great thing because they'll be able to be put online, but they're not available to anyone. But 
uh, we've been struggling a bit, and we use principally uh, two things. Uh, we have the very cryptic and entertaining uh, the Adio dei Scavi, the excavation day book, uh, which kind of tells you what room they were digging in on what day, and occasionally like what they found, and like how many workmen they were, and how much they were getting paid, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and then of the artifacts that they recovered, a subset of those they decided were important enough to uh, inventory, to assign a numero de inventario, uh, and each of those is provided with an inventory card. Uh, the system now has these kind of oak tag uh, cards that are uh, punched so that you could do kind of punch calculations and stuff like that. Um, uh, they're called a scheda. Italian, a scheda is the Italian word for kind of any kind of fiche or card or something like that. Uh, and the local slang is they call them the schede buffetti because buffetti is the main uh, stationary chain in Italy, and they had these printed up by Buffetti, so you have to learn the jargon. And they say, you know, Mancroli Buffetti, it means like the catalog cards are missing. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the basic item that we have to recover, though, from the big file of these to uh, get some idea about uh, where an artifact was recovered and when it was recovered and what they interpreted it as and, and so on and so forth. Um, we basically have been working in a newly rehabbed uh, workroom, which did not exist in this UNESCO heritage site until two years ago uh, at the main storage facility on site, conveniently located right across from the, uh, the main bar restaurant uh, at the site, which also has its own working bathroom, which is very famous to the site workers because it was used by Hillary Clinton, so they call it the, the Hillary bathroom. Anyway. Uh, and it also gives us this baffo view out the window of, of the uh, Vesuvius right here. And so we can happily work here with a nice cross breeze. Here you see Sarah Erickson, who's one of your students now in anthropology, uh, and Aaron Brown, one of our students in classical archaeology, uh, doing a, a digital scan of a, uh, a, uh, a sheet bronze uh, 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 casserole, which actually I'll talk about a little bit later today. So um, what I'm going to talk about are our results we've obtained in our work on the first two of the, depending on your count, eight uh, residences in the block. Uh, and uh, one of them is this one right next door to the house of the Venus in Bikini, uh, which goes by the name of the house, La Casa di uh, Lucius Habonius Primus. Uh, that's the name of its possible owner. I'll tell you more about how we can know that a few slides down the road. Uh, and so uh, that's 111, 5, 8, because it has doorways at both 5 and 8. Uh, and that's a nice third quartile house. Uh, and so here in this view of the north facade of our block, here it is uh, with its entrance at 5 right next door, you see, to uh, Vane and Bikini at the uh, northeast corner uh, of the block. Um, and then uh, the second house that we did is this uh, very uh, modest one, uh, a second at the boundary of second and third quartile, the so-called Casa Imperiale, the imperial house, called that because of a dipinto on the facade. It has nothing to do with the emperor or anything like that. Uh, and that's around the corner here. So I'm showing you an arrow that it's up that little side street uh, right there. Uh, and so that's a more modest sized uh, residence than uh, the, the first of the two. Um, what you see in this uh, uh, image here is a bronze, uh, uh, seal ring, uh, which uh, has on its business end, written in reverse, the abbreviated name of Lucius Caelius Januarius. This is so how you could uh, indicate your ownership of things. Uh, and this was recovered inside the so-called Casa Imperiale. Um, and while it's not a certain identification, it does suggest that someone residing in that property was of this name and uh, could well have been the uh, owner of the property. Uh, and I would say that the first of the two houses, the uh, Lucius Habonius Primus, uh, is similarly uh, one that produced one of these seals with a man of that name, and so that may be the name of the, uh, of the owner of this property. Uh, that certain is by no means uh, certain. Um, what you see here is a uh, plan at the bottom of the facade of the north end of the block. It was excavated by Spinazzola in 1914, and then uh, a drawing of the elevation, 
uh, which shows you, among other things, that uh, there was a second story over part of this block. Spinazzolo was obsessed with facades, and that's why he just dug all along the street and wrote this giant book all about facades at Pompeii. So we know a hell of a lot of about facades, uh, and a lot of the houses he dug, he just like dug a meter into them and quit, uh, and, uh, which was the case with our block until uh, Maioli started excavating there, you see in the 1950s, where he uh, excavated uh, the rest of the block. Um, and here is that image that was at the front of my talk that was asked about. This is uh, from Spinazzola's 1953 publication, so 40 years after he dug it, um, uh, reconstruction of the facade of that block with an altar up the side street there, you can see at the right, uh, a bar right here at the corner with a bar counter, uh, and uh, the, the Casa di uh, Lucius Abonius Primus uh, down here, and the Casa Imperiali just out of sight uh, up the alley there on the right-hand side. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about uh, how we work on these materials. Uh, it's pretty generally low-tech. I have a low budget and a small group. Uh, and so much of what we do is just careful uh, 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 observation of things with the naked eye. And in particular, we're looking to gather information about um, various use alterations, which will give us some indication about uh, what these particular artifacts were actually being used for and how intensively and if they were being curated and things of that sort. Uh, and we also are interested in looking at uh, what I like to call uh, micromorphology, that is uh, very small scale bits of evidence you can often see in the super, on the surface of artifacts which give us some idea about the actual manufacturing techniques and the order in which they were undertaken. So those are the things that we've been uh, focusing on in particular. Now to record our information we have this uh, vastly overdone by me uh, database in uh, FileMaker Pro 17 now uh, which has uh, I think seven different tabs and 90 something different fields and this is what we deploy for our in-depth description of a particular artifact. Needless to say uh, few artifacts require us to make comments in all of these fields but if they have evidence of that kind by God we've got a, uh, a place in the, in the, the database where we can record it. Uh, and so you, you see how the tabs stacked here for you. Uh, we have our first one which is basic identification and, and things of that sort, right? Uh, and not particularly interesting. Uh, and then the second one is where we uh, like to uh, park some basic graphic documentation, some information about that. So we got a field in which we can drop in a low res picture and if we take a photo micrograph with a, uh, with a uh, uh, digital microscope, we can drop it in here, and it's also the place where the person who's described the artifact can queue up our photographer, who's Susanna Fosbush, who's out there, uh, so she knows what kind of, of shots we need, although she's really only about five feet away from us, so it's not like we can't just like tell her. Uh, and uh, then we go on to uh, one which is measurements, uh, where we record some of that basic information, but we also like to look at uh, other, let's say, uh, characteristics, other attributes of artifacts that people don't often record. Uh, uh, we weigh them, for example, because we're interested in understanding of calculations of value, so the amount of material we have is of interest to us. We also like to, for example, uh, measure uh, the maximum diameter of vessels to figure out maybe about how they could have been shelved and stored. Uh, we like to, for closed vessel forms, measure the, uh, uh, the minimum uh, size of the, the aperture so you can figure out if you could get a hand in there or not. And so uh, we record standard stuff but also a few other things that uh, most projects don't uh, tend to uh, pay attention to. Uh, we then move on to manufacture where we have various fields where we like to uh, say what the evidence is that we have for the various steps involved in the manufacture of each artifact and, uh, and then try to uh, work them out in order. Uh, and so that's what we do on, uh, on this uh, tab here. Uh, then we go to condition, uh, and this is where we like to talk about the completeness and brokenness of our artifacts, and also in particular uh, use alterations, evidence for abrasion, uh, breakage, chipping, uh, the deposition of residues of various sorts, things like that, and so that's, that's kind of among the more important things that we record, and that goes on this tab here. Uh, uh, some of the objects will have either makers marks on them, or they might have uh, text painted onto them if it's a transport amp or something like that. So we have a page that's our epigraphy page where we have everything we have to say about text and again we can drop a picture of a maker's stamp and, and things like that. And then we have a final catch-all page where we can 
put uh, uh, information about various sorts of analyses we might do, like 3D scans uh, or compositional analysis. We're doing a collaborative project with the uh, Second University of Naples, uh, characterizing some of our materials from one of our sub-projects. And uh, I also have a scheme for uh, basically uh, taking uh, Har uh, Harris Matrix software and tricking it into creating a, sort of a flow chart which allows us to document the different steps in production, which again we have a, a box there that we can uh, drop that into. Uh, so uh, we deploy this, uh, this database then to uh, begin to structure our uh, observations of the attributes of various artifacts and get all this stuff uh, recorded. Um, so I want to show you some of the kinds of results that we're getting so you can see the sorts of evidence that we have in particular uh, for uh, the use of these objects uh, and a little bit about their manufacture. Um, I'll say that in our database we have one field on the first uh, uh, tab where we record what's the standard assumption about how uh, any particular sort of artifact would have been or might have been used that's pretty broadly shared within our field. And then in our condition tab we actually have a, a different field where we actually state what evidence we have about and what we can say about how it actually was being used, right? So we try to keep these two things separate and, and keep both of them in mind. Um, so uh, we can start uh, looking at uh, some ceramics, but as I'll get to, we have very little ceramics from this block weird, well not weirdly, but disturbingly. Uh, uh, so I'll say a little bit about that. In fact, I'll point out that um, uh, we kind of have a situation opposite from typically what's the case in Roman archaeology where if you quantified it some way, like 99% of your artifacts are, are, are ceramic uh, and then you know your 1% is, is everything else, you have very little in particular uh, glassware and metalware because both of those were, were intensively recycled in the ancient world and so you, you rarely uh, tend to find those, uh, particularly when you're looking at, at discard context. Anyway, a bit about ceramics. Here's your standard kind of Roman uh, dinner plate and Italian uh, terra sigillata uh, recovered by the excavators with these three mm -hmm. giant chunks of the rim broken off. Uh, here's a couple detailed slides to show you that uh, we'll find things like cut marks inside, right, on some occasions, which if you're an historical archaeologist, of course, you're familiar with the phenomenon of efforts to uh, interpret cut marks. Um, and as is uh, very often the case with these uh, high-end uh, uh, glossy slip tablewares, you also get a lot of attrition of the slip on the surface. So you have a detail of a rim here showing you uh, how that's uh, been abraded away. And uh, indeed, we have a set of protocols which allows us to kind of quickly and conveniently characterize things like the, uh, the, uh, the location and the uh, amount of, of surface loss through, through things like this. That's one of the things that we like to record, particularly about pottery. Um, we found a substantial amount of glass artifacts. Glass blowing is invented in the first century BC and it really revolutionizes the archaeological record because glass goes from being kind of an expensive high-end item to something that's mass manufactured. Um, here you have a standard uh, balsamarium, a container for probably storing unguents and things like that. Um, glass tends to be pretty inert though with respect to use alterations. Um, this little unguentarium here, of which we have about 40, you can maybe see it has these little teeny sort of transverse scratches around uh, the interior of the mouth. Uh, my inference is that has to do with the stoppering and unstoppering of that, but in fact that's the only example of this that we've, we've actually found, so glass tends not to be very communicative. Um, uh, some glass vessels, like this uh, uh, plate you see right here, uh, are kind of promising in the sense that their undersides show uh, quite a bit of, of unstructured scratching in them, uh, which seems to be scratching which occurred before this was excavated. Recall this has been sitting on a shelf in a storeroom since about 1960. Uh, that is, uh, some of the uh, uh, volcanic schmutz that you get on the surfaces of objects seems to be inside some of the scratches. And so uh, this is kind of interesting that we are seeing this on, on this particular uh, sort of uh, a vessel. Um, and then we very occasionally get examples like this which show us deliberate modification. This is a flask of some sort. Uh, the upper end of the neck is missing and in this detail you can see it has a kind of a sub-regular break on it with a step in it. And if you know glass technology you know that this probably had its neck removed by a, an operation called cracking off. Uh, which there's a great YouTube video from the Corning Museum of Glass. You want to see how this works. If you have a glass vessel and you want to 
get the top off it, you scribe a little horizontal line with some uh, sharp object, and then you rotate it over heat, uh, and the crack propagates around perfectly, except where it comes back on itself, it often won't line up and make a little step. Uh, and so with this bottle, you can see that they cracked off the neck, probably because the rim had broken, right? And so they wanted to uh, modify this to allow them to keep it in, in use. Uh, but this is fairly uncommon with glass. Um, much more informative is our, uh, our uh, bronze, uh, uh, set of bronze vessels. Uh, here you see a, uh, a big bronze um, uh, water bucket, uh, it would be called a citula in Latin. Uh, and uh, this is super interesting because it has a big stiffening band in iron uh, under the rim, and then it has attachments for uh, a basket handle, you see, that would have pivoted that you could use to, to carry it around or to hang it on a well or uh, uh, fountainhead, something like that. Um, and what's super interesting is when you look at this, you can see uh, that, in fact, even though it has this iron stiffening ring, the sheet bronze is really, really flexible. And you, you can see how it's, uh, it's dished, right? That there are high points at the handles, and then it kind of curves down to a point intermediate uh, between. And you can see that the uh, presumably long-term use of this was kind of leading to this distortion uh, of the, the vessel itself, even though it had this iron stiffener. Um, Here's a uh, standard uh, cauldron like you find in the Roman world. Uh, and this again showed some kind of interesting use alterations. Uh, maybe a bit hard to read. You, you can't see this, but uh, this is a detail of the underside where it kind of comes to a little bit of a, of a point. Uh, and you can't see it, but there's a perfect divot X in the middle. And that's to do with the technique that was used to raise this from a sheet of bronze. Uh, but uh, all around that, all that uh, dark material you can see is uh, quite uh, a quite heavy deposition of soot, uh, which uh, confirms that this was being used uh, over a, uh, a heat source uh, set up high enough that the tips of the flames were actually depositing soot directly on the exterior. Um, the interior, you can see in a detail right here, is covered with a very thick deposit of this uh, light colored material, which we haven't analyzed, but it seems pretty clear that it's lime scale. Uh, and so uh, what this shows us is the vessel was being uh, used over a long term for presumably just the boiling of water or at least the heating of something which contained a lot of the hard water from Pompeii. But these are understood to be classic uh, uh, water boiling cauldrons. Um, and on uh, the right hand side you see a detail of a handle attachment where on the inside uh, you can see a couple of the rivets that have been pulled through. Uh, and this is different on this side and much sloppier here than on the other side, which is very neat and regular. It looks as though they actually reattached the handle at a later period uh, involving a uh, less attentive or less skilled uh, craftsperson, the person who did the original attachment. So again, you can see this evidence for the long-term curation of these things. Um, here is a, again, a similar sheet bronze and iron uh, casserole. Uh, and again, lots of interesting evidence for its use alteration. Uh, these are very valuable. What you have above is a, a detail of the exterior just down near the, uh, the bend in the wall and maybe you can make out a couple of rivets and then there's a, 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 a rectangular patching sheet behind. And so this was extensively patched, particularly in that part of the vessel, which was probably more subject to, uh, to, uh, to stress. Uh, and on the interior here, just opposite, you can see that they took what was probably lead putty and smeared it around the inside to uh, seal off that sort of repair. Uh, and so it, it indicates this interest in the curation of these valuable objects to keep them in use. Um, and uh, there are, are similar forms in ceramic, uh, but uh, of course ceramic can't be repaired the same way. And so the uh, metal object, uh, the iron, bronze objects give us some interesting insights. Uh, on the other side is a detail of the rim, and it may be a bit hard for you to see, but you can again see where some iron rivets are coming through for the original attachment of a stiffening collar. Uh, but off to the side, there's a second uh, set of perforations where it seems like, again, they were messing around with the rim area of this vessel to try to uh, bring it back into uh, workable condition. Um, I'll, I'll finish uh, with uh, a, uh, a bronze uh, inkwell uh, with its matching lid, which would have been attached with a little hinge. I guess Sarah Erickson, is, is Sarah here? No, she's not. She was our, our inkwell specialist, so she knows a lot more about this. But um, this one was uh, super cool, because you can not only see the seam up the side, where they took a sheet and rolled it and brought it around and, and soldered it back up, but it actually had a quite substantial amount of uh, uh, dark, organic-looking material inside, 
which was actually analyzed by an archaeometric team in the past and was shown in fact to be, uh, to be ink. Uh, and so that was uh, kind of cool to find all that stuff preserved and in situ. So those are the sorts of um, observations we're able to make uh, of our objects and all go into our database and then we can, uh, once we have this, step back and look at uh, what we can say about uh, not only uh, what was the set of objects that was in the possession of any particular residential group, but also how they were being used and how they were being curated and uh, see if we can gain some understanding about uh, patterns in this. And this brings me really to the issue that I want to finish up with, which is assemblage analysis. Now, uh, again, maybe I was optimistic. I don't know if anyone can see any of this, but uh, here is the plan of uh, Lucas Habonius Primus here uh, with a uh, table which summarizes room by room uh, the number of the room, uh, what we think the, the main use of the room was, and then a, a really quick shorthand listing of the uh, various artifacts that uh, are documented as having been recovered in that room. Each of those numbers represents a number in a scheme that I'm going to show you in a table a couple of slides down uh, the road, but each number refers to particular uh, artifact grouping and where you have a colon and then a number following a first number that's multiple examples of that that were found in, in that particular room. But uh, as you'll see we only have artifacts attested in room three and room four and so the question emerges what was going on either in those other rooms or with the excavation of those other rooms. Uh, here's a uh, similar scheme uh, for the Casa Imperiale uh, which again shows you uh, that we have uh, artifacts from only three spaces and one of those that I've labeled X we can't quite identify with one of those in the plan based on our archival work so far but I'm optimistic we'll be able to, I suspect it's that one where I've placed it but I can't prove that and we'll have to uh, try to get to that. Now um, one of the things that leaps out which I referred to is that there's almost no pottery from any of these residences um, and that's a function of the fact that the excavators in the 1950s and 1960s like basically didn't care about pottery, it was too unimportant. Um, and so uh, they uh, were not collecting and inventorying it, right? Um, and uh, I've tried hard to look at this lemons and see it as lemonade. For example, if they had collected all the pottery, the number of artifacts we had to characterize would increase at least 10 and more likely 20 times. And so I would never be able to finish even one of these houses in my lifetime. Um, and for reasons I'll get to in a minute, it might be that actually pottery is kind of, and I'm a Roman pottery specialist, it's kind of less interesting and less important uh, than the other elements of the uh, assemblages uh, that uh, we have. Um, at Pompeii, uh, even though they weren't collecting the pottery, they did employ an artist to go around after excavation and do these very nice sketches of uh, the houses after they finished excavating them. And here are two that have been published from the courtyard of the Casa Imperiale, showing in fact uh, some of the uh, amphorae in one cook pot and over here a, a dolium, a big water storage vessel that in fact were recovered in this property but uh, never uh, inventoried uh, by the archaeologists. Um, what I think is likely the case is they didn't just take all this stuff and throw it uh, but they didn't want to invest labor in it so they collected it and shipped it off to their main storage facility in this place called the Granai del Foro, the, uh, the granaries of the Forum. Uh, where it sits today in these vast rows, kind of like the last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, uh, with bars outside. If you go to the Pompeii Forum in the northwest corner, there's always these mobs of people in front of this one building staring through the bars, and that's the looking into the Granado photo because there's a couple of like the, the cast of dead people and stuff like that in there. You can see one of them kind of uh, here in between two of the shelves. So probably much of our pottery uh, wound up in the Granado photo, but it's not inventoried and we simply can't know what it was. And so whatever we do has to uh, take that into account. Now, uh, what I want to do in ooh, six minutes uh, is talk a little bit about uh, these two assemblages by comparing them with one from a farmhouse that we worked on uh, during uh, the first phase, subproject one. This is the Villa Regina Bosco Reale, uh, 1.2 kilometers outside uh, Pompeii. Uh, this is a farmhouse that was dug in its entirety in the late 70s and early 80s as a, modern, as a model excavation. Here you see it in this giant hole in the ground. It's been re-roofed and restored. Uh, and the idea was, was to collect all the artifacts that they found. Uh, and so here's some uh, basic background on that. It was published in a, in a monograph, so that's nice. All that work is done. And we started our project actually with that. Um, Here's a uh, similar treatment of the 
artifacts from use-related contexts inside the villa uh, with a table like you saw before and a plan of the villa with the vineyards around it. These have all been studied and we know it was the kind of center of a, a viticulture, a small viticulture estate. Um, it had this one Bafo storeroom where they actually took plaster casts of what had been the wooden shelving and they were able to sort of reconstruct what sets of objects were sitting on what shelf and the kind of thing you can only do at Pompeii, so it's got some very cool data. Um, now, um, what I wanted to do was to look at the assemblages from these two modest in-town residents and compare them with this farmhouse. Uh, and so uh, this obviously you can't see, but what this is, I'll give you a somewhat more legible version in a moment. I took all the artifacts and develop, uh, divide them into groupings as a uh, function uh, of their material and manufacture technique and their function, their form, and their size. Uh, and so each of these invisible rows is one of the 105 categories that I've got. Uh, and uh, then I've identified the kinds of objects that are in each one and then uh, uh, using some hocus pocus that I won't go into now, uh, I assigned each one a costliness uh, value on a scale from zero to ten as a function of its material and size and so on and so forth. This is a way of beginning to estimate kind of how valuable uh, these things would be. Now, uh, this may be somewhat legible. This is the upper part of that, the first 24 of these groups. So you can see a bit about what I've done. So I started with its uh, they're organized by activity, so I start with water acquisition and storage, then I go on to lighting, and then down to various cooking operations, and so on and so forth. So that's what these, these groupings represent, sets of artifacts that would have been used for those particular purposes as a function of their material, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I can look at them this way and compare across the properties and get a sense about what sorts of activities are recorded in one property and not in another, and, uh, or in two and not the third, and, and things of that sort. And I've learned some interesting things, which uh, I probably won't go into right now. Um, but you can also, of course, uh, reorder them. And here, uh, those, uh, they're reordered in descending costliness value. So you can also look at residence by residence and see kind of who is having uh, putatively uh, expensive objects and all the way down to the lower cost objects, right? So this is another way of kind of shaking and baking uh, those data. Now, um, as a way to start approaching this, uh, I uh, used an article from my former colleague at uh, SUNY at Albany, uh, later at Arizona State, Mike Smith, a very well-known astequista, maybe many of you used his work. He did this great article in 1987 trying to look for the, was there really a correlation in household possessions and wealth? And so he did things like he took colonial documents and broke them down to uh, different kinds of wealth and then sort of examined what sorts of durable goods you know you might actually find archaeologically as he's doing here. And then he looked at ethnographic work. Here's one done in a tenement in Mexico City where they sort of costed out the sorts of possessions that different families had and the higher, the wealthier ones and less wealthy ones and stuff like that. Um, and he also summarized some data which has really captivated me using the Gutman scale. And I don't know if people use Gutman scales or if they're passe in cultural anthropology, but basically what they're based on is that as a function either of the wealth of a household or kind of the maturity of a household, uh, people will tend to acquire durable goods in a uh, particular order. And if you freeze the action, look at any particular household, the more mature or wealthier other households aren't going to have, and you can order all of these sorts of goods in a, in, in a scale. And so if a household owns an air conditioner, it's also going to have a television set and, you know, uh, whatever else, a radio or something like that. And you can scale all these things. It looks like cross-culturally, um, there tend to be, obviously there are anomalies, but these things, these things do tend to sort out. And so as I thought about how to work with are highly defective artifact data which exclude ceramics and also are not reporting material from entire rooms which might have certain, let's say, certain functional implications. Uh, I began to think that a Gutman scale offers us some, some ways to move forward with this sort of thing. First of all, the lemons to lemonade thing is that ceramics are all very low cost items. So they're all going to be very, very low down on the Gutman scale. And so the absence of those is not going to actually I mean you're missing data that's going to differentiate between households of different wealth levels, for instance, right? And so uh, that's kind of a relief. Um, and then this issue about missing big chunks of assemblage I thought a bit about and it seemed to me that the way to go was to try to maybe not use a single Gutman scale but uh, to come up with multiple ones that you could then sort of uh, 
uses various measures, and if you happen to miss certain functional kinds of artifacts as determined by irregular excavation, that wouldn't be fatal to your ability to, to rank these things. Now, it turns out that there's a shareware software package that maybe you all use called uh, uh, Anthropack, uh, which has an option which allow, allows you to kind of create and analyze Gutman scales. Uh, it doesn't work on Macs, though. Uh, and uh, so I uh, hope to move forward with that. And so I've been looking at things like what sorts of artifacts co-occur in all three residences. And these are boring things, a small ceramic drinking cup, a ceramic lamp, and a glass balsamarium. Uh, so these are things that are going to be pretty broadly owned by people. But if I, I think about ways to move forward with the Gutman scale approach, uh, what I want to do is define, again, these different activity categories like lighting. Uh, and within those, we have your widely diffused, throw away like a light bulb or a cigarette lighter, uh, ceramic uh, terracotta lamp, you have your much higher end cast bronze lamp, and then you have lighting related equipment like this tabletop lamp stand in bronze you see over here. So you can begin to sort of scale different sorts of objects from you know, widely owned to more narrowly owned, sort of following the kind of ideas that you have behind the Gutman scale. And you can do this with various sets of things. Uh, closed cooking vessels, uh, an olla, that's where the Spanish word olla comes from, from Latin, in ceramic, and then in sheet bronze here. Uh, I'll just show you a few of these. Uh, uh, wine drinking cups, uh, a little terracotta cup, which you just saw here. One in glass, which is uh, somewhat uh, more costly, arguably. And then finally, sorry for the bad photograph, it's from an exhibit in Melbourne, Australia, because we couldn't photograph the thing directly, in silver. Right? This is a very high-end high -end vessel. Uh, and on and on. Uh, plates, uh, ceramic, glass, uh, cast bronze right here. Uh, for uh, drink serving, ceramic, glass, cast bronze. Uh, and a few more of these. Uh, a little bit different for the storage of high value things like unguents and perfumes. Blown glass, glass blown into a funky mold which makes it shaped like a date. Uh, and uh, lastly, a little container that's actually cut out of rock crystal. Right? So again, you can scale these sorts of things. Uh, and uh, I think this is the last one, uh, writing with ink. Here we have a uh, ceramic inkwell, and here we have one of these uh, bronze inkwells like I was looking at. So the idea is maybe I can define sets of these, and the fact that something doesn't have data in one is not fatal to our ability to sort of rank it with respect to the, the other households. And that's kind of the uh, way I intend to move forward with these sorts of things. Um, oh yeah, there's one last thing, fun thing. People love strigils. When Romans would go to the bath, they'd lather themselves in olive oil and take this thing, looks like a miniature high lie thing and they would scrape the oil and dirt off their body, right? And here we have uh, a couple of iron strigils on a ring, uh, low-end strigils, and here we have a, a nice bronze strigil which was once on a iron ring you can see right there, uh, which we don't find at the farmhouse, by the way. Only people in town were going to the baths, apparently. Anyway, uh, results to finish up. Uh, I'm presenting things on my lab's website, Ray Stromani, which you can go visit if you want to see some of the stuff we're doing on this or, or other projects. Uh, and uh, back to our happy crew, I'll point out that Aaron Brown, a, a PhD student in classical archaeology, is doing his dissertation on um, food preparation practices at Pompeii, principally looking at uh, the material culture that we're recovering in the houses to do with food preparation. And Susanna Fastbush, who's out here, is about to embark, or maybe she's already decamped, uh, is about to embark on an MA thesis where she's super interested in, in textile production. We have a lot of material culture, uh, needles in particular, which haven't been well understood. So she's going to kind of uh, uh, dig in uh, and, uh, and uh, look at needles at Pompeii, what they're like, what they could be used for, where they're found and not found, to gain some insights about uh, uh, that sort of evidence for, uh, for uh, uh, textile work. Um, and here I'm thanking people like the ARF, as you can see, for support of the project. And um, so that's an overview of what we've been up to. I'd be happy to answer uh, any non-hostile questions uh, that you might, uh, might have, or if I've glossed over things because I had like twice as much stuff as I could present, I'll happy to clarify those. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Ken. So, so Ted, great, great talk, and um, so you're working really with a museum essentially assembly. Mm -hmm. And so is there a real difference from that earlier excavation to the later excavation in terms of the context? Recording and does that does that really affect how things are how you're able to really look at some of the materials in, in, in e, situ? Uh, 
yes and not really in the sense that um, uh, beginning in the uh, 1970s, uh, the, uh, the Antiquity Service put a moratorium on new excavation at Pompeii from the surface down because they had this massive site that was exposed to the elements and not properly studied or published. Um, since then, there have been only very, very few new excavations that aren't excavating in already excavated areas to clar clarify stratigraphic issues and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, new excavation is done much more up to what would be normal international standards, but we're not working on any of that material because that's all like important people have that and they're not going to give it to us. So, we're working almost exclusively with materials that were recovered. Uh, I think one exception is the Villa Regina farmhouse, which was high quality. Uh, but our stuff from inside the town is, is pretty much stuff that was recovered in, in, um, in circumstances which, you know, wouldn't be the way you'd do it today. Um, so it's the earlier return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the idea is to find particular contexts which are ones that um, are relatively good and also that promise to be particularly informative about issues of artifact life history. So. Uh, surface deposits of refuse on streets, uh, things like that, which give us these little windows into some of those sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. Sarah? So when people are doing research, like if she's going to be looking at needles, does she have to go manually through these shade or these cards and like find every... Every damn needle yeah. uh, in a haystack? Yeah, um, right, rem comago tetagisti. That's Latin for you hit the nail on the head, which means you touch something with a needle. Uh, anyway, Jeeves says it all the time in, in, uh, in Bertie and Jeeves novels. Anyway, uh, uh, yes, uh, and it's not computerized, uh, but they're moving towards that. But here's the positive thing. Susanna knows that back in the magazzino, in the store, in the, the Casa di Bacco storage facility, there's a cardboard box with like 400 freaking needles in it. So, uh, so they're all there. So basically, I think she'll be able to um, reverse engineer her list by taking the needles and getting the inventory numbers that are on them. It's kind of like having the, you know, say so having a bunch of books with a card catalog on it and then going back and finding it in the catalog itself. And can you coordinate with other teams doing this kind of work so that you're all contributing to making this nice big system that other people have been? Uh, like well, my aspiration would be uh, that, I mean, the, 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 the Parco Archaeologico is doing its, its own work to try to bring this stuff into some kind of searchable, organized thing. Um, uh, my um, aspiration is to, when I can finally publish this stuff, maybe make the point that some of the things we're doing are useful enough that other people can design projects that will be able to interface with the data that we generate. Um, now that might be wildly optimistic because everyone thinks they've got the best idea, you know, and, and whereas I actually have the best idea. Uh, but uh, uh, but that would uh, that's kind of the 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 idea that we have. Um, but it's a vast mass of stuff. Yes, Christine. Do you think that your um, vineyard villa, but they were fancier, richer people than your folks living in Pensacola? Um. Actually, the opposite. That, that this is a this is a relatively modest villa. There are big, fancy, mansion-like estates where they have silver services and all this kind of stuff. This is this is kind of the poster child for like a lower, well, medium rank villa. I should confess that it, uh, I didn't go into this, but the villa seems to. There was a big earthquake in Pompeii in AD 62, 17 years before the eruption, and so the town was kind of like if you went to New Orleans a couple years after Hurricane Katrina. It's not like a normal town. Uh, and many of the structures in Pompeii were clearly damaged in the quake and never reoccupied or reoccupied in kind of partial or uh, anomalous ways. And this farmhouse looks like it was being used but not lived in. I won't go into the details. Um, uh, the kitchen, they just let the kitchen ash build up till it went right over the cooktop and, and kind of like frat boys, you know, putting dishes in the sink until that, that's full, and they'll start putting them in the sink in the bathroom, you know, instead of like washing the dishes. And what they did is they then took their storeroom, where I showed you that shelving, and they, they seem to have, we can't sequence this, but there's like a little hearth built in the corner there. So it looks like after they like filled up the kitchen with kitchen ash, instead of like taking out the garbage, they said, screw it, we're gonna build another, you know. And so the idea is there might have been workmen in the vineyards who were actually using this residence kind of as their day house for lunch and naps and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, but everything in Pompeii is complicated that way. You know, like nothing's beautifully, inter you know, it, it ain't no neutron bomb situation, you know. 
but nonetheless, what's striking is the farmhouse, if we'd gone into this, produced almost no glass, or like, you know, 90% of the finds there are ceramic, and of the other 10%, there's like three glass vessels and three bronze vessels. And so if you compare those absolute numbers with what we have in the houses in town, the, 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 the quantities are, are quite different and, uh, and also uh, uh, qualitatively kind of the sorts of things we have are also different in some interesting ways. But it's only, a, you know, 1.4 kilometers from town. It's not like you couldn't walk into town in 15 minutes, you know. Yeah. I was just curious, since you found this cache of needles, is there any evidence of textile production and what, what it entailed? What, what, what was it? I don't know. All right, the cache was created by archaeologists. They put them all in one box. Uh, but uh, that's a, a, I'll, I'll kind of fudge on that answer that um, it, it looks as if, um, you know, uh, textile manufacture was largely um, farmed out and was going on inside resident residences, um, and which would not be surprising. Uh, we do know the Roman state in the late empire had these giant textile manufactories because they were producing garments for soldiers and officials and stuff like that, but that's a very distinct sort of, of operation. So you do find loom weights, and, and the, the issue is, is that you know, you would need multiple loom weights to actually tension a loom. Um, and there aren't many cases, like you find one loom weight, two loom weights, and like, you know, what do you do with that? You know, uh, or they use them as paperweights. Or, uh, and so there aren't many cases where sets of loom weights have been found uh, suggesting that, in fact, what you're looking at is a place where a loom was set up and no longer exists, but the weights, so they're typically there. They're usually ceramic, occasionally in lead. Um, that's another kind of thing I suppose you could kind of scale in terms of the, the value of the material. Yeah. Yeah. I have an entirely non hospital question. Okay, good. Um, so in, in terms of the, uh, the Gupta scale mm -hmm. uh, that you're using, um, does the, do the steps in, in the manufacturing process of these items, are they scored to you in some way? Well, the, the yeah, good question. That the, um, what I showed you now is just something I kind of did quickly because I would get this article out. Um, and, uh, but, uh, if you think about how you could in some useful way estimate the relative cost of different kinds of artifacts, certainly the, and this gets back to a certain um, article written many years ago by a guy named Kent Lightfoot uh, about the production, oh, Kent's already gone, so he can't bask in it, uh, this production step measure article. In other words, clearly the, the number of, not clearly, I suppose, uh, it seems reasonable to suppose that there's some correlation between the, the the, the complexity and number of operations involved in manufacturing an object and in some sense its, its cost. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that will be one of the factors that when I do this in a serious way, I will, uh, we record all those uh, deliberately for this reason in part. Um, so the, the material, the amount of material, uh, the, the manufacturing process which involves the different operations and the nature of the operations and to some extent kind of the expertise involved in doing those are all things that that I, I want to factor in, but I want to be deliberately vague because clearly all I can do is come up with some kind of a approximation that might correspond with some ancient uh, ancient Roman reality. Uh, so I don't want to lean too heavily on any claim that about these things. Within objects in a particular material, I feel fairly confident I can sort out kind of an, an escalating you know, cost in terms of uh, the operations involved in making it. When you try to bridge between bronze and ceramics, glass, things like that, that of course gets, gets somewhat trickier. So did I answer your question? Yeah, I did, didn't I? I love the Harris software hat. Oh. That's awesome. The, oh, oh, the Harris matrix. Uh, yeah, it's basically they, they want everything to like begin to the ground level and end with like, you know, virgin soil. And what I want is like raw material preparation and ending with a finished object. So it's, it's all I have to do is like cut the end off and stick. It's, it's not very clever. I'm not a very IT adept person. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment to say thank you for a great talk, but also uh, thank you very much for my favorite new archaeological phrase that you always talk with. And it turned it up to the diagram. Oh. Yeah, all right, well, good. I'm glad that uh, something about it is useful. Uh, uh, it's just, you know, it's the basic Mike Schiffer thing, but with, with a bunch of Roman stuff plugged in there. Uh, uh, as a classicist, we're all obliged to do that. Okay? All right. Thank you for your attendance, and uh, see you all next week. <laughs>